I invite you to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, and we're going to grab a verse there. We'll be in several different verses, several different places, but we're going to, we're going to be in Romans 6 early and, and then a little bit later as well. So if you want to uh, put, a, put something there, but uh, I bet just about everybody has a cell phone, don't they? Yeah, I mean, uh, oh, you're even reading your scripture from the cell phone. It's nice and quick if your fingers are quick enough, right? And, uh, you know, uh, one of the first things I did when I got a cell phone, uh, got this last cell phone, is uh, I deleted a bunch of apps. Somebody just sent me a text or something. My phone just buzzed. Uh, but anyway, the, uh, you know, that's one of the first things I did. I deleted a bunch of apps and because, uh, and, and they're called, those apps are called bloatware and a few other more unsavory things that I won't mention. But, uh, but uh, the idea that, that there's, uh, that there's things that you have on your phone that you don't even want, they're apps and app is short for application. And so as I was, uh, I had this title in my mind for a week or better with the idea of resurrection application and because I want to I want to have a practical message with you this morning. I want it to be a practical message. I have three main points that I want to share with you this morning. And uh, but did you know, did you know that you can you can get about 255 billion apps your phone can only handle 20,000 if you got one better than mine. Uh, most people have about, according to one record here, most people have about 80 apps on their phone and they only use about 30 of them every month. I don't know, how are you doing on average, average there? Some of you young guys, you might know, you might have like, uh, you know, I. I Okay, I'll admit, I only have 20-ish. I have less than 20 probably that I ever use. There might be some that I think, well, I might use that. But I do not play games on my phone. And some of you are saying, you, what do you do with your time? <laughs> uh, uh, I do not do banking on my phone, even though my banker has told me for years that, well, I can help you get that set up. I don't wanna. <laughs> I don't send money over with my phone. Vim, Vimmo, is that what it is? Yeah, so that's one of them. Okay, I probably shouldn't say what I don't know. Yeah, uh, but that kind of a thing. I, I, and uh, so some of you are thinking, yeah, you've already exposed the ignorance that you have about what your phone can do. you and uh, you think I'm nuts because I don't use all the power that's in my phone. Well, I'm going to tell you that the average person does not use the resurrection app to the fullest, uh, fullest of its capacity. And that's what I want to talk to you about. There's a resurrection app, and a resurrection app can challenge you. It can give you, it can give you assurance of salvation. It can give you the key to living the Christian life, and it can expose you and encourage you in the hope that there is in Christ for eternal, your eternal future. And and uh, when I talk about the idea of there's that people don't have assurance of salvation. One of the reasons I said what I said when we were taking up the offering uh, that I almost missed. Uh, one of the, I said that because, you know, there are people who think, well, if I give a little to the church, I, that's going to help me get to heaven. When we, had our, when we had our communion service earlier, I made the statement. I said, partaking of that does not save you. It's Christ and Christ alone that gives us eternal life. It's the gift of God, and that's what our verse talks about in, in our, our context here. Now, I could have said, I could have spent this, this message on giving you proofs of the resurrection. And uh, I don't think that would convince anybody. I don't think that'd convince you necessarily, but I'm just going to read one verse as we approach as we approach these other verses with resurrection apps, and uh, and I'll, and if you if you have any doubt about the resurrection and just reality, I dare you to dig into it. I dare you to study it and dig into it. But in uh, when uh, 
when Luke was writing the book of Acts, he said, speaking of Jesus, he, he presented himself alive after his uh, suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them 40 days. Acts chapter 1 and verse 3, that's a portion of it. Luke says, infallible proofs seen by them, and most of you know that he was seen by over 500 witnesses at one time. And then there was other incidental incidental uh, times that, that in those 40 days that individuals or smaller groups saw him. But over 500 witnesses, and uh, you, you take, that to, take that to any court, and uh, it would prove the resurrection. And so, but what I want to emphasize today is that the resurrection is so, is so infallible, it is so true, it is so true that it gives life. And that's what I want to focus. My, every one of my points are going to say, they're going to say, talk about, we're going to talk about the resurrection app, but it is new life or life anew. When Jesus Christ came out of the tomb, he had, a, he had a, the same kind of a body. It, it looked like the same kind of body, but it's interesting, in that resurrected body, he could walk through walls. That was a new body. It's new life. And there's more that we could talk about, but I want to talk about new life that applies to us. And number one, I want to talk about resurrection life with, uh, with salvation. I think that's, the, that's really the key thing. And notice at the end of Romans chapter 6 and verse 20, 23, it says, the gift of God is eternal life. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. On our, on our symbol on the wall here, uh, the symbol that I have last year's pin that we gave out last year on the resurrection, Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. We're going to turn to 1 Corinthians 15 in a moment, so you could turn there if, you're, if you've already read Romans chapter 6. But it's the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. You know what it's not? It's not some sort of reformation. That's religious bunk. Reforma you can't reform yourself enough to gain eternal life. You can't change. You need new life. And new life comes from Christ who died and was buried and rose again. And then he gives the gift of eternal life. It's, we have new life, 2 Corinthians 5.17. In fact, if we, if we stop and think and we recognize the scripture, this old life that we have without Christ, this old life without Christ, the scripture calls the flesh, that is, is absolutely sinful. It can't do anything pleasing to God. In other words, it, 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 doesn't, it cannot reform itself. It's sin-saturated, Ephesians 2 tells us, from both mind and action. It's sin-saturated. Or as we, as we saw in Romans chapter 3 last week, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none good as far as God is concerned. And we're all sinners. That's why we need the new life of salvation that is only tapped by faith. You know, how do you get into your apps? You swipe and you tap, right? You get into your apps. And how, do you tap the, how do you tap the salvation that is the gift of God? By faith and faith alone. You know, I, you've all heard the stories of a, of a genie coming out of the bottle and giving you all these wishes, you know. I think deep down within every one of us, there's a desire for eternal life. There's a desire to live beyond this life. Any of us that have lived a few years, you know that life is short. Life is short. It's brief. We've all lost loved ones. The only hope is the life that Christ gives. That's the only hope that we have. And it, that's where new life comes. It's the gift of God. 
and it, you know, you swipe your phone, you push the app. What if you could do that and you get automatically got eternal life? You know, it's that simple. Right where you sit right now, right as you're listening on the, on the TV right now, you can have eternal life by trusting, putting your faith in what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross. He not only died, he was buried, and he rose again, and that's what we're celebrating today. That confirms what God promised. That confirms this gift is genuine. That confirms that what Christ did on the cross in paying for our sins, that it was enough. Or as the choir saying, it is finished. It was all done in Christ. And that's why, as Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 tells us, you can tap it by faith. By grace, you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Oh, that's like Romans 6, isn't it? It's a gift of God. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. The only boast we'll ever have in heaven is Christ and Christ alone. And the only way we get, get to heaven is by faith in him. It's faith alone, through Christ alone, by grace alone. Let me read the scripture that ties in with our, with our symbol up here in the front. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Gospel is a simple word for good news. Which I preach to you, which you also received, in which you stand, by which also you are saved, saved from hell to heaven. Yeah, we're talking about eternal, eternal destiny here. Saved from hell to heaven. If you are holding fast what I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. It's all about faith. Faith alone in Christ alone. If you don't hold fast to what Paul said, in other words, if you don't believe it, then you're missing out. You're missing out on the salvation that is the gift of God. And then he explains the gospel. He says, for I delivered to you, so here's the Apostle Paul, first of all, what I, that which I also received. In other words, God gave this man, this apostle, revelation from him. Direct revelation, planted it within him. And so he says, I'm going to share that with you, what I received from God. That Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Christ died on behalf of our sin, took our place. He was our substitute. He took the death that we deserved, or as I've heard some people say, he took my death penalty. He took my death penalty. The wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23 began there. But the gift of God is eternal life. And because he rose again, he imparts eternal life to everyone who believes. His re resurrection is so vital. That new life, you know, to giving new life, that without it, Paul says there's no salvation. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 17, he says there's no forgiveness, but you flip that around. Because Christ has been raised, because Christ has been raised, we can have eternal life. We can have salvation. We can have forgiveness. We can have this gift from God. I pray that you're trusting Christ today, that you tap the app by faith the salvation app. And then the second one I want to bring out is living a new life in your Christian walk. Not only is the resurrection the, the source of eternal life, it's the source of the power to live the Christian life. And just like salvation is obtained by faith and not works and not the law, the, the Christian life is is lived by faith in the, in the finished work of Christ. And you can only live it out by your connection to that resurrected life. Whereas maybe salvation has a real strong focus on the death of Christ, 
the life, living the Christian life, is a focus on the resurrected part of that. And I'm, I'm coming back to collage, or I'm coming back to Romans six here in a moment, but I'm going to share with you a little bit from Colossians three, and just show you that this idea of resurrection life is a, ought to be a motivation for us. It ought to be a motivation. He and he says, if you were raised with Christ, he's not. He's not wanting you to question whether or not you were raised with Christ. He's, the if goes further on in the context. Everyone who trusts Christ is so connected to Christ that he has been raised with Christ positionally in the heavens. Every believer can say, yes, that's me. But he says, if that's true of you, he said, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting on the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. And then he, then he makes the bold statement, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life, and I'm going to stop there, but he calls Christ our very life. It's resurrection life. And it's challenge, challenging believers, challenging those who know Christ to recognize that we were raised with him. We died with him. We were raised with him. And he, and he said that ought to make a difference. And, you know, that's really the bottom line of this, of this message. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We can sing the songs. We can talk about it. And we can say, yes, it's a historical fact. But the reality is there, he did it for us, so there ought to be application to me. There's application for me. It's a practical sense. It's not just out there somewhere in the past. There's practical application, and Christ died in my place. Pretty rare to hear, hear that about a human dying for another human. But Christ in human form did that for us. There's application for us every step of the way. Turn with me to Romans 6 if you would. And I want to give you the idea and keep, have you keep in mind, we have a position in Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that we're seated with Christ in the heavenlies. Well, I see you seated here in Tip City. You know, uh, that, it's, a spiritual, it's a spiritual truth that that's where you belong. That's your connection, seated with him in the heavenlies. That's a spiritual truth about you. And that's what this is talking about in the context here. Then apply that. Apply that resurrected truth to the new life that God gave you. And so oftentimes, you know, oftentimes... Christians will say, well, I don't know if this pleases God. I don't know if that pleases God. I, I struggle. I still sin. I do that, you know. There's victory in resurrected life. And I know there's, there's complex things here, but we're going to try to just give you the, the overview of Romans 6. It comes from the idea of, uh, well, I sin. And you know what? When I sin, I notice that God gave me grace. And he forgives my sin. Well, let's just continue to sin so that we get more grace. A lot of people take salvation that way. When I, when I explain salvation is by grace through faith that you can't earn it, you can't do anything. And when they get it, they say, you mean I can live as I please? Romans 6 says no. Romans 6 says God has a purpose, he has a plan, he has a design for, for our lives if we're trusting him because when we trust him we have his life within us and that's what he's telling us in the context and so verse 1 the end of verse 1 in Romans 6 says shall we continue in sin that grace might abound certainly not certainly not and that's the point of this whole passage is don't take advantage of grace don't take advantage of grace you know, we have a lot of liberty. We have a lot of liberty in our, in our nation, don't we? 
if you want to, you can get on your car and you can go down 571. How fast would your car go? Some of you might know. <laughs> I'm glad Charles is uh, retired already, a policeman. <laughs> yeah, but, but yeah, you have that liberty. But you know it's not pleasing to the law or your wife. It's not pleasing to your pocketbook. How do you live pleasing to God? If you have his life, if you have his life, that's what we're going to go see. He goes on and he tells us in that, in that verse, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Who died to sin? Every believer. Every believer, every, anyone who trusts Jesus Christ can say, yep, that happened to me. I died on that cross when Christ died. I was buried when Christ died. I was raised when Christ died. That's all our position in Christ. And maybe that's what you have to think about when you see the circle around it there. That's you. That's you in Christ. How much sin does a dead man do? How much anything does a dead man do? And that's what he's saying. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? We have this inseparable connection to Christ. We have a connection to him. An intimate, perfect, solid connection to Christ. That's what this is going to get to. And he says, he says in the, in the next verse, Or do you not know? In other words, there must have been some that didn't know the truth about this connection. Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Now, one of the first things I want to do is tell you, get water off the brain here with the word baptism. Get water off the brain. This isn't about baptism. This is about, this is about a connection with Christ. Jesus talked about, I have a baptism to be baptized with. What was he talking about? His death. And he's saying the same thing here. You were baptized, and what were you baptized into? Water? No. Christ Jesus. If you're, if you're connected to Christ Jesus, then you're connected to his death. This is one-time spirit baptism. In him, we are connected to his death. Or did you not know that? That's what he's asking. Therefore, we were buried with him through this baptism into death. Oh, see how he's explaining it there? There's no water here. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. So he's saying, yes, you died with Christ. You were buried with Christ. You were raised to new life with Christ. It's ours. And just like we were identified with his death, we're identified with his resurrection. And that ought to make a difference. That ought to make a difference. This is where we have victory over sin. This is where we can have a different perspective on life itself. Going on, verse 5. For if we have been united together, oh, what does that mean? Connected. If we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we will be, in the, be connected in the likeness of his resurrection. You can't have one without the other because Christ didn't stay dead. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. Co-crucified is the Greek word. In other words, when he was there, I was there. Co-crucified with him. That the body of sin might be done away with or out of business. That we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. 
here it is again, that emphasis on living. We're to be so, we're to be so saturated, so, so thinking about our victorious connection with Christ that his, his life and death are mine and it, and it makes a difference. Verse 9, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death has no more dominion over him. Is he going to go to, is he die again? No. Once was enough. Verse 10, for the, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Death and life, they're ours. Christ in our stead. And what's the practical part of that for us? How do we tap the app? Verse 11. Likewise, you also reckon. That word reckon is, is, a, is a mathematical term. You add it up. Add up this truth that he's been talking about. This truth about our connection with Christ that's inseparable from him. Inseparable from his death, from his resurrection. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. Why? Because you were. Count that reality be, to be yours. This isn't to sweat it out some way and say, oh, I'm reckoning, I'm trying hard to reckon. No, this is trusting what Christ has done. This is understanding what he has done and then tapping the app, applying that in our lives. By faith, count the reality of what Christ has done in it for us and that we were identified with him, connected with him in death and in resurrection. And we tap that app by faith. So not only are we saved by faith, we live by faith. And then lastly, I don't wanna, I just can't leave this out. Probably several of the songs that we sang this morning pointed to life that's new in eternity. I imagine, I imagine when you trusted Jesus Christ, if you trusted Jesus Christ, when you did, you were thinking about heaven, eternal life. I'm not going to go to hell. I'm going to go to heaven or something like that. That's probably some of the things that you were thinking about. And that's a resurrected truth. You know, if Christ wouldn't have raised, there's no hope. First Corinthians deals with that in several places there. But I want to take you to I want to take you to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and read a familiar passage. And uh, the, and I want to do this because sometimes there's a lot of even confusion among believers who say, oh yeah, I'm going to heaven someday. And a lot of, they, 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 and they'll tie in, for instance, Matthew chapter 24 and say, that's how I'm going to get to heaven someday. Jesus never mentioned the coming of the Lord the ra that we call the rapture. Jesus never mentioned that till he revealed it to the grace apostle Paul. But let me just read it in verse 13. For I do not want you to be ignorant, brother. Here it is again. Get your head in gear, people. I don't want you to be ignorant. How are you going to tap the app if you don't know what you're talking about? I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. This is hope beyond this life. For we, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, ha, huh, what's that? The simple gospel message, isn't it? Death, burial, resurrection. If we believe, see, it's about faith. Even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So for those of us that are in that camp who are trusting Jesus Christ and him alone, we have a hope, we have a hope that one day we will be gathered together and see our loved ones again in heaven. We have that hope and we have that confidence in Christ. That's because he died and rose again. But going on in the con context here, 15, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. In other words, there's no advantage if you're alive when the Lord comes back or if you're dead. What's going to happen? He says, uh, 
Verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. I like that little phrase. We're going to be together with them. In the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Wow. Wow. That's resurrection hope for eternity. Because look what he says in verse 18. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Oh, that last phrase, we'll always be with the Lord. Always with the Lord. These words ought to be a comfort and a sense of peace to us. The hope of being with the Lord together with those who have died is all linked, linked to the death and resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19 says, without resurrection hope, we're miserable people. We don't have, I mean, what do we have? And then Paul comes in with that powerful, my favorite resurrection verse. But now Christ has been raised from the dead. In other words, we don't have to be miserable people with no hope for eternity. Christ has been raised from the dead. And that's the same grammar that we saw earlier. He has been and he continues to be alive. That's the sense from the Greek. And he's become the first fruits of them that slept. For Israel, first fruits offering were the first of what's going to follow. They expected there would be more to come. And here, here it's because Christ has been raised, we will be raised. When the trumpet sounds will be changed from this mortal everyday body to an immortal body fit for heaven. And we'll experience, we'll personally experience, personally experience victory forever. Life eternal through the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because we've tapped the app. We put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ today. And we have a hope for eternity. I pray that you've tapped the app. That you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ who died, was buried, and rose again. Because in Christ, we have, we have hope to live victoriously today and to, to live eternally tomorrow. New life awaits because Christ has been raised. New life awaits because Christ has been raised. He is risen. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the truth of your word, for the truth of the resurrection, for the truth that's so valuable for salvation, for the truth that's so valuable for walking with you, for the truth of our hope forever. Thank you, Father, for the glorious resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.